And so how many are ready for the word? All right. Well, that's good because <clears throat> I'm ready to bring it. I've been off for two weeks and I'm ready. All right. So we are in a series. We are in a series titled, I Build My Family. I build my family, and I want to just take a moment and recognize publicly, I've already done so privately, but Pastor Deidre, my wife, and then Pastor Chris last week have done a phenomenal job in laying a foundation and bringing this series. I love you. I honor you. Um, in fact, I had a guy out in the lobby say to me, uh, a respected gentleman say to me, Pastor, you know, I've loved your preaching. Uh, I, I mean, I just love your preaching, Pastor, for the last, you know, even 20 years ago when you were a young man. I always loved your preaching. I love your preaching today. And then he said, but you can leave anytime you want because, man, your wife and, and the team that, that's here, and I agree with him. We have an incredible team of gifted leaders and pastors and teachers and, and so thankful for them. But um, we started the series, I Build My Family, a couple of weeks ago, and I want us to go ahead and turn to two places in our Bibles this morning, turn to two places. We're going to begin in Genesis chapter 2 in just a few short moments, Genesis chapter 2. So turn there and then put a bookmark in Proverbs chapter 24, Proverbs 24. Genesis 2, if you've got a paper Bible, put a bookmark. I've got a ribbon in my Bible, and you can put that in Proverbs 24. Just, just have that marked because we're going to hit that a little bit later on. Um, if you're using a smart device, then click on Genesis chapter 2. All of the scriptures that we are going to be referring to will be on the screen behind me. You can jot down the reference, study them throughout the week. That would be just wonderful. But our theme for this year um, here at Victory Church has been rooted and grounded. Rooted and grounded, where we, we where we believe that God wants to He wants to establish us and ground us in Him and in His Word, so that we can bear fruit in and through our lives. and And I want to recognize for just a moment, and I want to say this up front, that I in, in my message today, listen, I am talking to believers. I'm talking to followers of Jesus. Now, I know that as followers of Jesus, we are not all in the same place. We're on, we're, on, we're on a similar journey, but we're not all in the same place. But I'm talking to believers. If you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus or you're watching, whether it's online or television, and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, some of the things that I will say today not only will affirm the last two weeks that we've heard, but it may come across as something so foreign to you, almost counterculture. And I make no apologies for it, but I just want you to know that my challenge, my challenge today is to the believer in the room. The things that we're going to be talking about today, I believe, I believe that as we end our time together here today, that many people in this room, followers of Jesus, are going to take a stand this morning and they're going to determine that no matter the dysfunction, no matter the abuse, the trauma, and the pain of your family history, I believe that there are many people in this room that are going to stand up before this service is over and say, it ends in my generation. It ends in my family line. From this day forward, from this day forward, we're not going to continue to pass down curses on our children and our children's children. We're going to pass on blessings on our children and our children's children. Our kids are going to look back and they're going to point to that one man or that one woman that this morning stood up and say, we decide today to do it God's way and to break the generational curses off of our family line and off of our generation. I believe that's going to happen at the end of this message. And so I want to I let you know up front um, uh, that, we, that I recognize that, you know, there may be people in this room, you're not yet a follower of Jesus. You don't have to do anything that we're telling you to do today. Not, you, don't have to, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to do anything. Because I recognize that Jesus is not yet your Savior or your Lord. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we do not have a right to change or to modify or to redefine what God has already defined and said in his word. Amen. We're just simply taking a look at what he's saying in his word and we're receiving it, whether it blesses us or it bruises us. Amen. Amen. All right. So one of the things that we are being intentional about, intentional about this year is our mission measures. And I can't stress enough how important our mission measures are. We are called by Jesus in the Great Commission to make disciples, not just to make converts. We're called to make disciples, followers of Jesus, disciplined followers of Jesus. 
to know him and to help other people know him and grow in him. And our unique context sparks our unique mission of challenging everyday people to experience every victory in Jesus. But how do we know that we're successful in our mission as a church? That is where our mission measures come in. And for the last couple of weeks, you've been seeing up on the screen our mission measures. And our mission measures, they are like, they are like a target that helps us know what to aim for, but also when we are hitting the mark. They help us know when we are growing spiritually. And so up on the screen, these are our mission measures. When I can look at myself in the mirror and say that I am growing in these areas, his word leads me. His word leads me. His spirit powers me. I build my family. And that's highlighted because that's the mission measure that we're focusing on in this series. I share his victory. I live in freedom And I command my finances. These are our mission measures. And we also created what we call developed by statements. Where we take the mission measure and we just dive a little bit deeper into that specific mission measure. And so, for example, up on the screen, you're going to see the developed by statements under I build my family. In a much deeper way, in a specific way, this is how we can know that we're being intentional in building our family family. And so the developed by statements are understanding God's design for gender, sex, marriage, and family, embracing healthy singleness, investing in the success of my marriage, acquiring tools and skills for better parenting, prioritizing active church engagement of the whole family. And I want to take a moment and just kind of remind us and, and kind of go back. In part one of this series, Pastor Deidre, my wife, she laid a very solid biblical foundation in her message that she preached on, this, on the first message of this series. We learned through that message that the entire creation account is set up around divinely instituted binaries. Those binaries, those pairs are light and darkness. They're earth and sky. They're water and land, sun and moon, even the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and male and female. And we learned through that message that God established these binaries. And he established them, listen, with boundaries that separate them, rulers who rule over them, and moral injunctions about what is to be done or avoided. We learned in that message, that first message, that creation is good. That there is a dignity and a glory to our physical bodies and we were never intended to be used for vessels of shame. That there is a dignity to the body. And I so appreciate her laying that foundation. And then last week, my goodness, I tell you what, I I listened to both my wife and Pastor Chris. And I was just blown away by uh, my wife has more of a prophetic bent to her preaching. And and then Pastor Chris, I mean, he's just a teacher. He's a biblical, he he carries the biblical gift of teaching. When I heard him, I thought, man, I I can't think of a a better teacher uh, in the planet. I mean, he just did such a wonderful job. But in that message last week, he talked us, he he spoke on the beauty of singleness and the mystery of marriage. And he spoke to everyone in the room, whether you're single, whether you're married, he he unpacked that. And he talked about how we are either shaped by design or by deception. We are either governed by God's truth or our own truth. And I just want to take a moment and I want to affirm their position because it's not just their position. They didn't give you their opinion. They didn't give you my opinion. They didn't give you the opinion of a denomination. But they they gave you the position of God's word in a very clear way where there is no confusion. And I want to just reinstate that and reaffirm that, that as Christians, as followers of Jesus, and here at Victory Church, we let God and his word define family, marriage, gender, and sex. Not culture. We let God do that, and we let his word define that. Now, I know that's challenging in the kind of world that, but I also want to appreciate, I affirm their position, but I want to appreciate their posture. They weren't ugly. 
but their posture was one of kindness and respect. Which 1 Peter chapter 3.15, it says that's how we are to, we, we're, 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 that's how we are to uh, behave towards the outside world. And I, and I thank God for the compassion and the kindness and, that, and the respect that I saw in the posture. I mean, Pastor Chris, as he talked about how he's, how he's, he's, he's sharing what he was sharing with an open hand and, and many of us received. I, I, listen, I know that as, for some of you, even as followers of Jesus, there was that the, the message kind of, it really challenged you as it should but listen to me we should never confuse the universal affirmation of the gospel with the radical transformation by the gospel I'll say it again we have love and compassion for everyone no matter what or no matter who they are why because Jesus died for all our position can be founded on God's word, but our posture must always be with kindness and mercy and gentleness. But we should never, ever confuse the universal affirmation and inclusivity of the gospel. Whosoever will come, we should never confuse that with the radical, with the, with the radical transformation by that gospel. Amen? I recognize that the gospel both blesses and bruises us all. Because if we are following Jesus, we should be able to confess that we have been bruised by the demands of discipleship. The call to die to self and live a holy life, taking up our cross to follow him. There is a blessing and a bruising of the gospel that whenever Jesus asks us to give up our greed, our propensity to gossip, our jealousy, our disordered affections, our anger, and even our self-orientation. Reminding ourselves that Jesus is Savior and Lord of all. And I just heard a preacher say this, and I just took it because I thought it was so good. When Jesus saved us, we've got to stop acting like he just saved us from the waist up. He saved us completely, body, soul, and spirit. Now, I know all of us are on a journey, but I do. Not, even if I disagree with what he said in his word, I do not have the right to redefine it, to change it. No, I don't change the word. The word changes me. I don't get a right to transform what it says. The word transforms me. Amen? And we're not ugly about it. We, we just, we, we, we believe God's word, and we believe in the power of the gospel to transform the life. The same gospel that looks at every man, every woman, no matter the sin, no matter the darkness, no matter the abuse, the addiction, the shame, the pain, the gospel that beckons everyone to come, the inclusivity of it. Is the same gospel that loves you too much to leave you in the condition where it found you. If you let it, God will transform you by his precious Holy Spirit from the inside out. Amen. Isn't he good? Go ahead and give him thanks for just a moment. There is a blessing. The gospel both blesses and it bruises. But the blessing, listen, I've learned that the blessing is always greater than the bruising. The blessing is always greater. Listen, our, 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 our flesh and our pride doesn't like God's no. Because whenever God says no to us, it always feels like harm and hurt. But listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. God's no is always a deeper yes. It is. Every single time. Behind every God's no is a deeper yes that is for your good and for your future and for your destiny. And until you are able to just live into who God is and what he's called you to be, you'll never experience God's deeper yes because we're always fighting his no. But we want to challenge each other to recognize that, yes, he's our Savior, but he's also our Lord. And we will follow him and not follow our own, our own, our own opinions or or that of culture. He is our God. And listen to me. This series is important. Here's why. Because we need a better understanding of what it means to be a Christian in an increasingly non-Christian culture. Not just what it means to become a Christian. 
We need a better understanding of what it means to be a Christian. And so in your notes, if you're taking notes, I've got two thoughts for you this morning. The first one is more of a theological thought um, that we're going to uh, try to simplify as best as we can. And as you can tell, I'm losing my voice. I don't know why. I, I did have a little head, head cold coming back uh, since coming back from El Salvador. But uh, the devil is a lie. I'm going to preach anyways. Come on, somebody. <laughs> um, but I, I want to give you two thoughts. The first one is a little bit theological that we're going to unpack. And, um, and then the, the, the second thought is more of an application. It's something that we can actually take home and do. Um, as, and we're actually wrapping up this series, I Build My Family, with this message. So the first thought is this. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down. The family, number one, the family as a reflection of the Trinity. The family as a reflection of the Trinity. In the same way that our singleness and marriage is an icon or an image to the world, so is the family. In its own unique way, the family is an icon, an image, a mirror of God to the world. And the family sits as a reflection of the Trinity. Now, what is the Trinity? Well, as followers of Jesus, we believe in one God. But we also believe that God manifests himself in three eternal distinctions known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The theological word for this is Trinity. Three tri in one, Trinity. And I recognize that there is a mystery to this. And there is, there is a mystery to this, that, that God dwells in community within himself and, and, and that he summons us to reflect that community to the world he has made through the family. Because it requires, a family requires a father mother and a child and so and so a family is in its, its its trinitarian in it in its mirroring of god to the world in genesis chapter 2 verse 18 i had you turn there it's the first place i asked you to turn in genesis 2 18 it says that that god said it is not good that man should be alone and so every, every time, we, we've got to go back to the beginning. Pastor Deidre went back to the beginning. Pastor Chris went back to the beginning. But in the Gospels, whenever Jesus was confronted um, in his day and in his culture, they brought up, they brought up the, the issue of divorce and marriage as well in his day. And so what Jesus did, he did the same thing. He says, in the beginning. And he went all the way back to Genesis. And in the beginning, God looks at man before he had created Eve, and he said, it is not good that man should be alone. Adam was alone, and this was not good. This is not that he was just kind of single alone, right? He wasn't just a single with options out there. No, this, this is a deeper solitude rooted in his very being where he was the only one of his kind in the universe. And as an image bearer of God, and as an image bearer, God wanted to invite Adam into the joy of participating in this divine community and communion and reflecting the mystery of the triune God. And so what does he do? He puts Adam to sleep. He puts Adam to sleep. He takes a rib out of his side. He fashions a woman, a female, out of, out of that rib. And he wakes uh, Adam up. And Adam looks at this female, at this woman. Who, and, and, and the Bible doesn't say that God called her woman. The Bible says that Adam called her woman. And I think in my mind, most theologians agree, is that you know at, God created man. He created Adam. And so Adam knew he was man. And then he looks at this counterpart, this completely other different creature that's just like him, but, com but completely different at the same time, and he just stands up and says, whoa, man. <laughs> and there you go. God says, that'll work, woman. <laughs> I'm glad my filter's working this morning. It's on, baby. It's on. <laughs> Filter. Filter's on. 
But he created, he created male and female, male and female, and, 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 and it's a beautiful thing. And, and then he tells them in Genesis 1.28, he blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply, reproduce. And we see that God's original plan, his original design was for one man, Adam, and one woman, Eve, to enter into a lifelong covenant relationship. And that through that union, through the one flesh act of sexual union, to join him, God, as co-creators of more image bearers. That they would join God, that they would step into the inner life of the Godhead to not just have communion and covenant with one another, serving and loving one another, but to actually participate in the creation with God to become co-creators of other image bearers. This creative and relational process reflects the Trinity. Forming a triunity of persons, an intimate unity of father, mother, and child. And, and I think about how it is not uncommon for you and I to sit in this room today and how our view of God, whether it's God the Father or even Jesus, has been shaped either directly or indirectly, by how well of a job our dad or moms did as image bearers of God. Are you following me? Some of us have grown up in such a dysfunctional home that the image of God in our mom, our dad, in, in their marriage, in the home, has been so distorted that we grew up thinking that God was just like my deadbeat dad. That I've got I've to prove something to God because I always had to prove something to my dad. That God is never happy with me because my father was never happy with me. That God will leave me at the drop of a hat because daddy or mama left me when I was young. And so we grow up with, with, with in dysfunctional homes. And this is all of us. We all have some level of dysfunction. Listen, if you have no crazy people in your family, you might be the crazy person. Oh, everybody's normal in my family. Everyone's great. Yeah, and they're talking about you. You're the crazy one. But conversely, conversely, when we image God well, not just in the world, but in our small world of family and, and the, the closeness of that unit, we, we give our children and we give our spouses and we give those in our world, the, we, we give them an advantage to be able to grow up and to see that God is a good father. See, some people, they can't hear that and understand, what do you mean God is a good father? What does that even mean? What does that look like? Because we, we, have, we, have, we, have allowed, we have allowed culture to define what this looks like because of our own sin and dysfunction and, and, and abuse and trauma that has come down from the generations. They have created an idol, which is a distorted, graven image of what God actually looks like. And so, and see, it impacts all of our lives because the family is an icon. It's an image of the Trinity. Yeah, I, I, I think about one of the times we got it right. My family, we got it right. And I say that because, listen, I, I don't stand up here kind of looking, you know, down my nose at you as if we get it right and you don't. Listen, we are a work in progress just like you. We've got things in our family line that we're still dealing with. We've got, we're, we're, you know, our, we've been married 25 years and you see us and we are happy. We do love each other. But it takes work to do that. I'm still a knucklehead sometimes. My wife will tell you. That's why I don't let her up here to preach all the time because she'll, she'll, she'll release some of that dirt. She, she, she's 99.9% .9 perfect. That point one point, I'll stop there. God. But we got it. We just we got it. We got it right this week. We you know my my I went to El Salvador with my my three daughters. We only have three daughters, and I went with them. And so my wife was home alone. And so when we got back Monday morning at 3 a.m., I got off the hour of 3 a.m. 
uh, on Sunday. That next day on Monday, we decided, you know what, let's go to breakfast as a family. And we did. We went to a local restaurant. We had breakfast. And when we sat at the table, our server comes around. And when she comes to bring out the menu, she's just smiling. She's looking at us. And she says to us, are you guys related? She said, because you all look alike. And I said, yeah, we are. I'm mom and dad, these are our girls. And she walks away and she says this. She looks back and she, with a big smile, she says, you have a beautiful family. And, it, and, it, and, and I remember turning to my wife and, and I said to her, I said, honey, she just called the Trinity beautiful. She just saw God. And, and, um, and, and, it, and it was, it was one of the moments where we got it right. He, and one of the ways we got it right is that we were all, we had our phones. We all had our phones because, you, you know, you, you have them. But none of us were in our phones. Is that a miracle? None of us were like this, you know, at breakfast. You know, all my three girls, we were all engaged. We're talking. We're having a conversation. We're actually talking at a table. We're, having, we're asking questions. They're telling mom about their experience. I'm saying, oh, you know, Hadessa share with them this. I'm telling my, my wife how proud I am of each of our girls. And it was a beautiful moment. And, and, I, and all of that, it's a picture of the Trinity. Think about what this woman said. She said, you all look alike. You bear each other's image. You are not each other, but you are. There is an image. Of us. It's like they're little icons of us. It's a beauty. It's a mystery. And then the communion that was shared, this loving thing, it was a, it's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And, and, and it was just a, just a powerful moment that we experienced. And, and so I wanted to build that, that foundation, that theological component. And, and the, the next thing I want to sh- share with you, that when it comes to building the family, this is where it gets a little bit practical. Listen, number two, if you're taking notes, write this down. It's my responsibility. It's my responsibility. And that may sound simple. But my challenge to each of us here this morning is to leave here today and stop blaming everybody else. Your ex, your mom, your dad, your family, your grandpa, your environment, what you didn't have, what you did have. And start taking responsibility on starting where you are and building your family from this day forward. Because I'll tell you, it is not my responsibility to build your family. It is not the kids' pastor's responsibility to build your family. It is not the youth pastor's responsibility to build your family. It is your responsibility to build your family. It is my responsibility to build my family. Obviously, I'm qualifying that I don't do it in absence of God. God is the preeminent. He's the, he's the pilot. He's the leader of my home. But he's given to me as stewardship my family, my wife, my daughters. And it is my responsibility that no matter my background, no matter the pain that I've experienced, to at some point say, I'm taking responsibility from this day forward. Here's why this is important. Listen to me. Listen to me. Hear me well. You don't want to build a family that your children reject or have to recover from. They shouldn't spend their 20s getting over their childhood. That should be a time for them to be able to grow and to learn and to become. And when you make the building of your family a priority and do it by the book, not just any book, but by God's book, when you take his instruction manual for life and for family and for a home and for a marriage, when you make it a priority, see, because somebody else is making your family a priority, there's a devil loose and he's making your family a priority. He's making sure that he divides your family, that he destroys your family, that he brings destruction to your family. Some dad, some mom, somebody, a grandma, grandpa, son, or daughter has got to stand up and say, if the devil is making my family a priority, I'm going to make my family a priority. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And when you do that, listen to me, when you do that, you give your children an advantage that maybe you didn't have. And for some of you, you will be the first generation in your family to have a godly family, 
To have a family that rightly, not perfectly, we never, none of us get it right all the time, but that can rightly reflect the Godhead to the world around you. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3 and 4, this is where I had you bookmark, and this is, this is just some practical teaching. This is Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. He, 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 he gives us basically, we're going to find in these couple of verses instructions. How do I build a strong family, a strong home, a strong marriage? If you're hearing you're single, listen to me. Get these two verses in your heart. Memorize them. This is how you do it. This is, this is how you build a strong marriage and a strong home and a strong family. It says this, through wisdom a house is built, by understanding it is established, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. This scripture is about building a strong marriage, a strong home, and a strong family. And I want to take a moment and recognize that we are all in a different place here today. And I get that. I had a precious lady, even in the lobby after first service, just, you know, she, she fighting back tears because she's in the midst of a divorce. And, and I get it that some of us, that's our reality right now. And a message like this, if you allow the, if you, see, because it's, because the seed of the word is going out. You know what the devil's doing? He's trying to take the seed of the word out. And he'll tell you, this message isn't for you. Look at your life. You're so messed up. You're getting a divorce. Just tune them out. Just leave. This message isn't for you. And see, God, if you let God, God will work even in the midst of some of our own brokenness. And, I, and my point is, I get that we're all in a different place. Some of us here, our kids are already adults. They're in their 30s and 40s. I mean, and, and a message like this, you're like, well, how, you know, I've... I already did this stuff. And for some, you're looking back with great regret. And a message like this can feel so, like, condemning. But listen, condemnation is not God's spirit. God will convict you, but he'll not con condemn you. What's the difference? Condemning is taking your face and rubbing your nose in your past and in your mess. Conviction is recognizing where you are, but God giving you the strength to say, from this day forward. I may not have been all that I could have been yesterday, but today, here's how I'm going to be. With God's help, I'm going to be better. With God's help, I'm moving forward. I can't change yesterday, but I can change today, and I can move forward. And so I recognize that we're not, some of us, we, our, our kids were just born. They're, they're, in, they're in nursery, you know. It's one of the reasons you come to church. For, for about an hour and a half, you just get a break from the kids. They're in victory kids. Some of you got, you, you got young teenagers. Some of you got, like me, my wife and I, we've got two young adults and a teenager. And pretty soon they'll all be graduated from high school. So I get, we're all in a different place. Listen, I have regrets looking backwards. There are things that I, I can look back and say, man, we just, we just sat down as a family. My girls wanted to watch this very ancient piece of technology called a videotape of when they were kids. And so we sat down a few nights ago and we popped on, you know, like when they were born and like their first birthday and second birthday, our oldest, who are 22 and 21 now. And, and looking back, it was so special. My wife was so beautiful. Man. I, I, golly, sorry, that was just, a, <laughs> but she was so beautiful, and she was she'd been such an amazing mom, and you look back, and you, and you think when, when you have that moment, you say, man, I could have done, but you know, I can't change yesterday, but I, I can look at today and say, today, I'm going to move forward, and, and, and so that's God's heart. Notice in these scriptures, in these verses, he says it's wisdom, it's understanding, and it's knowledge. Notice that he doesn't say it's love. He doesn't mention sex. He doesn't mention holding hands or cuddling and kissing. He doesn't mention emotions. It's not what he mentions. And yet here God is giving us the, the, the formula for a successful family, a successful marriage, and a successful home. And he says this. He says, it is built by wisdom. That's how it is constructed. That's how, that's how it is built, by wisdom. You establish it through understanding. And that word establish means that it is firmly rooted and cannot be moved. And then it's through knowledge that its rooms are filled with precious treasures. And this right here, the, 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 let me explain this last part where it says that knowledge fills the rooms with precious treasure. It's talking about it's talking about, it's speaking of the atmosphere of your home. That's what it's talking about. He's not talking about like, you know, um, 
uh, you know, like, 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 you're, like you've got treasure chest in every room, like you're some pirate, you know, with, with treasures. It's not, it's not in the physical. It's, he's talking about the atmosphere of your home. Have you, have, have you ever walked into a home and, and, and the atmosphere, I mean, there's love in the home, there's peace in the home. Have you ever, when you were a kid, you visited a friend's house and, and you didn't want to leave? Or maybe it was a family member. Maybe it was grandma and grandpa. There was just, there was a peace there. There was a love there. Conversely, have you ever gone into a, a, a home and, and no one had to say anything, but you knew that, that they were talking to one another? Because it's icy, right? It's cold. It's like, ew, like what's going on in here? You, you know why? Because the atmosphere of our homes either have treasure or they have trash. And we don't do anything about it because you can't see it with the natural eye. But guess what? You can feel it. You can walk into a home and you can febreze it all you want. But it smells because there's trash there. And the word of God is saying that the Bible is saying, he's saying the key to keeping the ice out of your house, the key, the key to keeping trash out of your house is knowledge. You read it again, it says every room is supposed to be like beautiful treasures in this place. Precious things. It's a nice place to come home to. The kids can't wait to come back from college. They didn't want to leave in the first place, but you kicked them out. You're going. They can't wait to come back. They can't wait. They, they want to invite their friends over the house. Why? Because it's, it, the rooms are filled with treasures, and, and, it's, and it's a precious, it's precious thing. It's a nice place to come home to. You want to be in every room together. Every room seems to be like a special place of treasure. It's the atmosphere. It's a beautiful atmosphere, and it's knowledge. Peter, the apostle Peter goes on to say, husbands, you're to live with your wives according to knowledge. Knowledge. Knowledge is important. In fact, I want you to write those three words down. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And then we're landing the plane. We're landing the plane. And, and as you're writing those down, give me your ears. I understand that, I, that this isn't exhaustive. I can't give you the key to everything in life in 30 minutes. I can't do it. I just can't. But I can help you to get started, and that's what we want to do today. And so as you write those three words down, I want you to take knowledge, and right next to knowledge, right next to knowledge, write this other word, write information. Information. Because that's what knowledge is. Just to break it down. Knowledge is information. Listen to me. You need information. No relationship works without information. Just doesn't. It's the reason why, you know, when, when you know, Pastor Brennan and Pastor Bree, they're getting married. You know what they're getting? They're getting marriage counseling. In other words, they're getting information. They're getting knowledge. My wife and I, we got information when we were engaged. We went to marriage counseling. Because no relationship works without information. You need knowledge. The problem is we go after the wrong information. Way too often. We go to the magazines on the shelf, the checkout counter, and everybody wants to give you information. They want to give you information about sex. They want to give you information about, you know, your body. They want to give you information about how, how, to, be, how to be healthy and thriving and flirty at 40. About your marriage, about what works, what doesn't work. You can find information everywhere about the home and the family and marriage. The problem that you and I have, and listen, I'm talking to followers of Jesus, is we often get wrong information from bad sources. We get it from the magazines. We get, them, we get it from, from uh, TV personalities. We get it from Hollywood. Our marriage is on the rocks, and so I'm going to call my cousin who's been married five times. Hey, can you give me some advice? We, 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 we go to, 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 to bad sources and we get wrong information. And so here's the question. Where do you get knowledge? Where do you get your information? You've got to start here. Now listen, I know I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> because all of us in this room, all of us watching, we have a leg up. Why? Because you're getting information here. You're, this is what's happening. You're getting information. And that's a good thing. 
That's another reason why we started Victory Groups. Why? Because not only do we want you to experience this corporate time of worship sitting in rows, but we want you to begin, begin meeting in circles where you, where you get to connect with one another. And, and not just get more information, but here's the second one, understanding, right? You, you start at, at information. You start at knowledge. That's where you start. But number two is understanding. And right next to understanding, write down this word, comprehension. Comprehension. Now, I know that's a big word, but listen, to comprehend means to be able to mentally, cognitively relate to the information to the point where you can assimilate it. Where you can assimilate it. To understand means you can take information and the concepts can be assimilated. You understand them. The Bible says you must get understanding. Because understanding establishes, roots you in, establishes that house. Not just information, but understanding. Where you're able to take that information and assimilate it. And that's, that's the next step here. That's what we, you, you're getting information and that's good. But we, and that's why victory groups are so important. It's an opportunity for you to, in a smaller setting, ask some questions. Pastor said this on Sunday. Can you help me understand it? Help me understand. Help me unpack what he said on Sunday. There was something he said. And maybe, and see, if we don't have that, you could be coming for 20 years and all you're getting is information, but you never get understanding. And you wonder why it feels like life is always here, up one day, down the other. It's this way, it's that way. You never feel rooted. You never feel like you're really growing and bearing fruit in life. It's because the Bible says you need understanding. You need to be able to grow. You need that information and to be able to assimilate it. And then the last word is this. It's wisdom. It's wisdom. And we're wrapping things up. Wisdom. Next to wisdom, write down this word. Application. Application. Wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge effectively. So it's getting knowledge, that's information. It's getting understanding, which is comprehension. To be able to mental, mentally and cognitively relate to the information to the point where you can begin to assimilate it. And then as you do that, the Bible says, you build a house by wisdom and wisdom is when you now begin to apply the information the problem that the world has with us is not so much our position on things the problem that a lot of times the world and, and even some of our children have with us is that we have information and it's right information but we don't have wisdom. They've never seen it applied in our lives. We say the right things, but we live the wrong way. And the world hates a hypocrite. The world hates people that say, oh, you've got to live like this, and you can't do this. While you're over here on the side, you're preaching right, but you're living wrong. And they're looking at you saying, who are you? Because you've never developed your knowledge into understanding and your understanding into wisdom. And see, wisdom builds the house. I can, I've, I've applied. If you want to know what 25 years a healthy marriage looks like, it's because we've gotten information, understanding, and we've applied that information. We're, and we're, I'm telling you, we're not perfect. We're far from it. I mean, I'm Puerto Rican. She's Italian, which means we fight passionately, but we love passionately. It's a give and take. But wisdom... The Bible says that, listen, the Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing. And all you're getting, get that education, get that job, get that money. In all of your getting, he says, in all of your getting, number one, get wisdom. Wisdom is supreme. Wisdom is the ultimate. That's why the Bible never said that Jesus Christ is made unto us understanding. 
No, he never says Christ has made unto us knowledge. No, the Bible says that Jesus Christ has made unto us the what? The wisdom of God. In other words, Jesus is God applied. He is not just information. He is the application of divinity. He shows you how to apply God. That's Jesus. He became to us wisdom. And we need him, and we need each other, and we need to challenge each other to go from just, and thank you for being here, and this is going to grow, but from Sunday morning, victory celebration, that's wonderful, but, but how about we join a victory group? Why? Because it's another opportunity, it's another moment for me to take responsibility to build my family and to get information that I've been missing. Because I've been getting wrong information by my cousin and, and, and this person and that person and, and that person on TV. And I've been reading the wrong books. And I, and I need the right information because I need to grow in understanding. Because God, Jesus, wisdom personified, he's going to give me wisdom so that I can build. So that at the end of the day I have a house that is established and the rooms are filled not with trash but with treasures. And my kids want to come home. And then my grandkids, when I have them, they're going to want to come to my house and they want to be there and in there they'll find the treasures of peace and of love and of commitment and of and of love and and, and of unconditional love and and of of joy and then they now have an advantage but here's the question as we close and I love you but I have to ask Are your children going to have to recover from you? Or are your children going to be blessed by you? <laughs> and, and this is personal. Because in my family, the trajectory that my family was going, my dad, I probably would have still been recovering today. As a 47-year-old man, not married to this wonderful woman, not having the kids that I have, certainly not doing what I'm doing. With an alcoholic, drug-addicted dad, my mom getting ready to leave him, brought up in the inner city of Brooklyn, New York. If I wouldn't be recovering right now, then I would either be dead or in prison. And yet one decision that he made, I look at that man and I bless him. I say, I say Dad, thank you. Thank you. You weren't perfect, but man, thank you. Because your life made a difference in my life, and now it's generational. And one of the things that the devil hates, he hates successive generations of righteousness. He wants to break the family apart. He doesn't want the children and the children's children to know him. And listen, it's my responsibility to build my family. And in the same way, listen, in the same way that, that the cycles of trauma and abuse and of pain get passed on from generation to generation to generation, I've got good news for you. So does the healing. So does the godliness. So does the righteousness. And I, and I don't, don't want to be the reason that my kids have to go to therapy. And I recognize that some of you have come out of utter devastation from the family that you came out of. I, I get it. But, but would you be the first? Would you be the first generation in your family line to change that? Would you be the person that in the midst of the hurt, in the midst of your issues that you've brought from your family, would you be the person that stands up and says, God healed me and I will be a righteous parent, a righteous family member to build a family that lasts. I know what history says, I know what my past says, but this day I take a stand to be the first generation to say, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. <laughs> to let God heal you. To the single moms in the room, listen to me. You are not less than. God looks at you and he says he'll be a father to the fatherless. 
a husband to the one that doesn't have one. You are precious in God's sight. You are not alone. You have God and you have a church family. You've got a family. You've got dads and moms and brothers and sisters that will stand next to you and say, we can do this together. There are people on this platform that grew up with a single mom. You're here and you say, well, I'm a divorcee. I've lost my, no, no, no. There is hope for every person in Jesus. If Jesus modeled anything in his life, he modeled that he's a safe place to bring your broken life and your broken pieces and what's impossible for man. Listen, I can't, I can't heal you. I can't help you, but I know he who can. His name is Jesus. And when you give him the opportunity, he'll take the broken pieces of your life and you'll look back say wow let's all stand to our feet together this morning I took a few more minutes than I should have but I don't regret not one word that I've shared this morning in just a moment listen to me in just a moment we're going to pray for people it's what we do every week in fact it's probably the most important thing of today's service is taking an opportunity taking some time to pray for any person in the room that needs prayer you don't have to be a member of Victory Church to receive prayer. This is for anybody and everybody. If you're here and you need prayer for any reason, any reason at all, it could be your health, physical, it could be you need healing, it could be emotional, it could be relational. But especially if you're here and you're saying, Pastor, man, that word really touched me today. I, because when I look back, and, and I, I, think, I think of some of you, as a mom and dad, you, you, just, you just started your relationship with Jesus and you're bringing these little kids along and and you're like the first in your generation but you're saying you know what it's worth it and I want to and I want to take that responsibility and I want God to help me I, I, I think we're going to see altars filled here today some of you that are bringing your brokenness you're bringing you're bringing that hurt and you're saying God help me maybe you're a single that's recovering from your family upbringing but you're saying God I want you to heal me because I don't want to take this into my future I don't want to whether you remain single or whether you get into a marriage relationship what you're saying God I don't want to take this into my future but God I want you to heal me so in just a moment in just a moment moment my wife and I are going to bless you and at the end of that blessing you will be released to come and receive prayer no matter who you are honey can you join me prayer team can you come and as they're coming just keep your eyes open as we bless you today friends and family of Victory Church I bless you and I speak over you may the Lord bless you and keep you cause his face to shine upon you be gracious to you and turn his face towards you and grant you his shalom his peace, nothing lacking, nothing wanting. May you grow in knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. May he go before you and lead you by his word and his truth. And leave here today knowing that you're loved by God. And that he is for you, not against you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, if you need prayer, just come. We want to pray for you today. Just come.